gentrification is like a form of colonialism. During the financial collapse in 2008, African Americans lost 53% of their collective wealth. Banks manipulating them with these variable rate mortgages that started them off paying $500 a month. And then five years in, you get a balloon payment of $1,800 and then the house is taken back. In Buffalo, you go to the auction and you buy a block for a couple thousand dollars. You know, you could buy houses for $500 a piece. And then you have people who are selling them for three or $400,000. So now we got this pool of real estate investment sharks swimming around neighborhoods, looking to buy everything that they can. And even the slumlords in the neighborhood saying, well, I might as well get this person out because I know I can get somebody in next month that'll pay two or $300 more. We have had over 2,000 construction projects in the past five years, over $20 billion of real estate capital has been invested. The biggest, most expensive $100 million buildings are not paying in diamond taxes. And so that's created a crisis where homelessness, especially for youth of color, is going crazy. PUSH stands for People United for Sustainable Housing. So we offer affordable housing in the area, which is a huge thing. The most important thing is knocking on those doors to see who has those problems. That's how I got involved with Bush. Our work is to get people to develop communities the way that they want them to develop, that both engages people and involves people, but also works to stop climate change and gentrification at the same time. This is a, a reclaimed green space and access to the Buffalo River that is uh, deep in the heart of uh, a post-industrial wasteland. Upstream a little ways we have a couple different parks that have popped up since the industries have moved out. So we're coming back slowly. Buffalo is situated on the western side of New York State between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, about 20 miles away from Niagara Falls. Because of that, Buffalo was one of the first places to have electric power, so it attracted a lot of industry. In its heyday, Buffalo is actually the sixth largest American city. We were known as the city of lights. Um, there was a lot of technology, a lot of industry. We actually shipped the world's grain, I mean, even to France. You had the Erie Canal and St. Lawrence Seaway, which are pretty much the only two waterways that would get you from the Northeast into the Midwest. But then around 1970, due to things no longer being shipped by boats and other causes, industry left. We got the ports here, you know, where the ships used to come in and all that's died out. There was a lot of railroad work and everything stopped. We had two steel plants, which was Republic Steel and Bethlehem Steel. They're gone. I used to work at Bethlehem Steel when I was younger. It wasn't a place where you had to have education to work in, you know, when it closed down. A lot of them were just out of work. It was hard because, you know, a lot of them worked there for all those years and that's what they knew. Buffalo has gone through a very unjust transition and has been ripped apart. 70s, 80s, 90s, Buffalo was pretty much just left to rot. 300,000 jobs leaving. We were a city designed for about 600,000 people. Within a decade, uh, we lost more than half of our population, and we're still only at a population of 282,000 people. Embedded in that history, too, is a history of racism where, you know, the east side of Buffalo, where most of the, the African Americans and the west side of Buffalo, where a lot of the, you know, Latinos uh, have been deeply segregated. So Buffalo, to this day, is the sixth most segregated city in the country. You still face institutionalized racism. Our children are still getting suspended at a, a higher rate. Um, uh, black and brown men and women are still fill, filling up prisons. White flight out of the cities really causing a lot of challenges for people that could not leave, especially low-income people and people of color primarily were adversely affected. The Robert Moses Highway was a primarily middle-class African-American neighborhood that was thriving. A lot of the homes were captured by the government because of eminent domain. People demolished beautiful green fields so that people could come in and out of suburbia. 
If you fast forward today, there's generational poverty here in Western New York. The national average of unemployment is under 6% uh, on the east side of Buffalo, which is primarily African American today. It's about 32.5% unemployment. In Latino uh, neighborhoods, it's about 275 We're the third poorest city in America, just behind Detroit and Cleveland. I cannot get a job, and I see my mother over here on the corner crying. I can't help her right now, because they won't give me a job because I have a felon. What is the next thing that person gonna do? He's gonna go out on that street and he's gonna try to sell some weed. He's gonna try to be that hustler. So now he gets messed up in the system, can't find no job. It's been two deaths we know of, and this was only in last year. February 7th, Wardell Meach was murdered by cops from coming out of a marijuana house. Meach was stop and frisk. Jose, traffic stop. His car smells like weed. He gets nervous. He's on probation, he don't want to go back to jail. He thought he was getting away from the cops. And then they shot the innocent boy three times in his back as he fleeted for his life. If they're not moving us out, they're killing us out. You have just massive disinvestment where they just said, you know what, we're not gonna spend any money here. We're not gonna invest in making it better. We're gonna wait till the bottom's out. It bottomed out in the past 10 years, and now we're seeing billions of dollars being invested back into the city to rebuild it. All of the white people who left Buffalo after the riots, now they all want to come back. That street up there has always been where the wealthier side of the city begins. So part of the strategy was to preserve space right on the border of that that was not going to gentrify. Uh, by buying up as much of this property as we could. Myself and another guy, Eric Walker, co-founded the organization, and we co-founded it by knocking on doors throughout the west side of Buffalo, and that's how we built our initial board, community board. The Youth Action Team is a group of teenagers committed to make change and build power in their community. We canvass in the community to talk about the knock on doors, talk to talk to the community, talk, ask them about like, what do you want to see in your community? What do you don't like in your community? What you want to see in your community? What do you like about your community? I'm super inspired by these young people. I think one of the most beautiful things that I see is the cultural diversity, the number of languages, the number of countries all these students are from, and their willingness to speak out and to be a voice for their communities in ways that maybe their parents that don't speak English the students, uh, the kids themselves, are the ones that are putting themselves out there. It's a youth action team and there's a street team and we are all one group who are trying to fight for change. A lot of youth come here and they learn what is gentrification, what is inclusion in Sony, and we also try to break a uh, language barrier. Gentrification has been bad for us because, you know, it's, you know, taking away our friends putting them somewhere else. They build stuff in our community that's actually bad for our health. I've been to like two of the youth action meetings so far and it really opened my high, my eyes a little bit because I didn't know that all these kind of issues were happening in the community because for me I wasn't like out there seeing everything. The government is not for us. We have to fight for what we need. We have to build relationships. Our purpose standing in front of that door talking to that individual is to build a relationship with that individual. Me joining this team just um, I feel I feel really powerful because you know we could go uh, go around helping people. I'm really like grateful that I joined this team because I have someone that I could talk on, talk to and could rely on that stuff I can't even tell my own family, and yeah, it really empowers me. It kind of got me, you know, like, mm -hmm. start realize, like, who myself is, and like, to get on the right track, go to school. The whole purpose of this right here is to organize and build power so that we can get our needs and that our people won't have to suffer in the future. Building up something better, like, try to, like, make the future shine for us. Somebody knocked on my door and was talking about um, electric, um, gas, and to start a campaign on a national fuel campaign. I was like, really? Because my gas was off at that time. Tough choices. I was one of the uh, people who lost a job, got my gas shut off, 
and when I first became involved with PUSH, it was basically through the initiative to get national fuel to use a big pile of money that they collect from customers, $10 million, which is supposed to be used for energy efficiency, and basically the start of it was getting this money from national fuel and starting to insulate houses and actually making that fund work for people that needed help in paying their heating bills. Pataki was the governor. They had got money, but they took that money and was building high rises in Manhattan. So what we did was we fought to get control of the land. They had over 5,000 vacant, abandoned houses. We issued tickets to the city because you got a ticket if your grass was over a certain length. So we issued them tickets for houses that they own that they just allowed to become abandoned. We spray painted them in a building that didn't have no windows. And then when Pataki saw that he was the poster face all over a lot of properties in Buffalo, they wanted to know, who are these young folks? What are they trying to do? And we just told them who we were and they, they are listening. <laughs> An organization in Oakland called Movement Generation created a strategy framework for a just transition. So basically it's the extractive economy versus the regenerative economy. In the extractive economy, the worldview is basically to consume. The rules are totally counter to human nature, so it takes enforcement to keep the system working. We have to work. Um, it jobs to meet our basic needs, often having to divorce our values from it. And we see the purpose being the concentration of wealth and power for the few. With the regenerative system, the worldview is caring and sacredness. In other words, realizing that our resources are limited, using them most efficiently so that they'll last the longest, so that the largest amount of people will benefit from them. Our system of governance is deep democracy because we want everyone to have a say in how things work and how to plan it out. Our resources need to be regenerated so that we're not constantly paying someone else. Work wouldn't be through coercion and exploitation but democratic cooperation all towards a purpose that maintains this goal of social and ecological well-being. To get there we need to stop the bad and build the new. We also need to change the rules, right, through like policies, to the, the goal to draw down money and power into local communities because we know what we need where we live, right? And make sure communities that have been left out of all the jobs that either come and have left cities around this country are at the front of getting those jobs, right? The roots of organizing in Buffalo were really strong, so much so that the NAACP was started in Niagara Falls and Buffalo, New York. When our organization was founded, it soon developed into an organization that could buy land, take control of the land, build on that land, or do all kinds of other community planning to see what it was that the residents wanted to do. There's 108 properties that we currently own, a little bit over 108. We have partnerships with other organizations and they help us to develop the properties. The rents range between about 400 and 600 a month, mm -hmm. so it's income qualified. You have to be low to moderate income. Buffalo's cold, it needs to be warm, so we want to weatherize and be able to help other people in the community to actually do those, so even landlords. Push Buffalo helps coordinate weatherization efforts that are funded by the state, um, but take a lot of kind of like hands-on approach to get the people in the door. A lot of barriers, a lot of stigmas around needing a handout or needing assistance in these places, and we try to break those down. I live on Social Security, and you know, I raised you know six kids, you know, a single parent. My bills were killing me, $300, $400 a month, especially gas over the winter. So when they came in and, do, and did the weatherization, my bills actually went down to something like 100 something a month. Some of our properties have radiant heating and they use on the man hot water systems. All these little things that you do to put the house together help at the end to give you the best efficiency possible. Clean water is an important part of what PUSH wants to see happen. We've got a dual purpose sewer system that takes the wastewater from our houses and from our industry 
and the rain, rain runoff water and puts them into the same line. And when it rains a lot, there can be overflow of the system. So there's an overflow function that sends wastewater directly into the Niagara River. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, said, Buffalo, you are breaking the law. Most of the lots have a clay cap, so the water just runs right off of the yard and into the sewer system. Rain gardens grab the water, grab all the roof runoff. We got a contract with the city of Buffalo after we proved to them that our rain gardens could work, we also showed them another way that they could uh, keep rainwater out of the sewer system by laying down a layer of good soil and then absorbent plants that grab the water and hold it in that yard until it has the chance to seep through the clay cap and it can eventually do that. What we wind up with is really nice green spaces and absorbent lawns that will keep the water out of the sewer system. This park was abandoned. The community got together. We went downtown to talk to the city park commissioner. The city put money in. We found out it was money that was there all the time. They got a uh, new basketball court and, and um, volleyball. volleyball. We got a, a handball court. And across the street is MAP. Uh, which is Massachusetts Avenue project. They are building a new um, infrastructure, which is gonna have two affordable apartments. And it's, they building a green garden. They train youth on farming, where their food come from. They go around the city selling their vegetables. A couple of houses we developed is 10 winter is the green one and 16 winter is the yellow one. Uh, now, 10 Winter was originally uh, built as a demonstration project to be a net zero house. So, uh, uh, several energy efficient features were built into it. it. It has a geothermal bed that comes back this way. solar panels on this side of the roof. The solar preheater for the hot water system. It's super insulated and it's also done with uh, a steel roof which is cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Here in the back is an actual rain garden that is fed by the neighbor's building. You can see the downspout coming over and down. We had somewhere around a hundred young men and women come through over the course of two years for training in construction, green construction in particular, and because it was such a uh, cutting edge project. They learned some cutting edge trades. We work with a group called the Center for Employment Opportunities that provides opportunities for people coming out of prison. 16 winter we had community meetings about what we wanted to put in there. We wanted to make a house that had several bedrooms because there's so many refugee families that are resettled that are extended families. We work with the local refugee community as well as some of the immigrants in the area. So they consign some of their jewelry here and they make actually some of the tailoring and the seamstressing work um, that we have here displayed as well. We have about 69 different dialects just in the West Side and they're able to kind of see themselves represented still in this area. So we try to keep a lot of the culture, a lot of the music. This area is being heavily gentrified and if we don't kind of put a staple of those who actually live here, their culture in these spaces, then they will be erased and they will be eradicated. That was our first mixed use building that we rebuilt. It was the old Club Utica, which was like a honky tonk bar. So typically we're both visual artists and we actually have 25 different artists who are inside the store with us. The Five Points really didn't have a whole lot going on over here when we first moved over. So what we did was we put a stage out in front of the store in the summertime and we have people perform out there. So we do 11 acts in August. They perform to the neighborhood essentially and we have everything from punk rock to hip hop. This is School 77, which was a longtime school that served the west side of Buffalo. The school system had abandoned it, and we are transforming it into a mixed use community asset with 30 affordable apartments on the top two floors, senior apartments, and community space, and offices for three community based organizations on the ground floor an African American theater company, an after school youth program, and PUSH. 
and we also have a gymnasium that we'll be utilizing for community purposes. It was important for us to get a hold of this building before luxury developers did that wanted to make it $2,500 a month apartments. We're keeping it at $400 a month apartments for low-income seniors. One of the things that makes this project really special to us is that many of our members have personal memories in the building. Provi, for example, taught in this building for many years. We spent uh, three years trying to get to school, and uh, we walked around the block and asked people what would they want with this building because it was left for 10 years with no use. I remember going before the mayor to ask if we could get it. Once I said there were affordable apartments, he said, you can have it. A lot of the labor performed on the building is community residents who've been trained and progress into bigger projects like this. I really like it, you know what I mean? Have great jobs, do learn a lot of stuff. Like I'm um, in training now, learning how to be a, um, a general contractor learning how to run job sites. They was teaching us how to do solar panels. We're putting solar panels on the roof and we're going to create a community solar configuration where renters will be able to participate in having solar energy and credits on their bills. Energy democracy. It will be the first low income solar array in New York State. So you pay one bill to use the service at all at the utility. You still can't get completely off of the grid, balanced out by the energy that was created by that system. Those payments that people are making every month. Everybody who is a tenant, whether you are paying into the system or you couldn't or you fell off, everybody comes together and gets to decide what that revenue gets used for in relation to the needs of that community. So for us, this is a demonstration project because our goal is to power the whole West Side like this. And if we can create enough space in here to prove that it works, we can get to the table with the utility to say we want this much space, we want this much funding. People that's in power are not going to give it up easily. Isn't nobody going to give us nothing. We got to fight for it and get it for ourselves. When you get it, you share it.